I want God to get on to me now. Or I have an altar where he has mercy. But if I wait till later, there won't be no mercy. There'll just be judgment. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I don't know if Sunday school is what they're doing this morning. They staying? Well, I'll preach to all of you then. <clears throat> Amen. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 62, the promise of resurrection. All of our hope is tied up in Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. Amen. Paul said, if Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain. But he's alive and he's risen. And he's given us truth. I'm so thankful for the truth we have. You know, you can go to a lot of places and get miracles and get music and get a lot of stuff. But if you ain't getting truth, you're missing out on the best stuff God has. I believe God heals folks in false doctrine as long as they have faith in his ability to do so. I believe God does that, but I believe we are extremely blessed to know that Jesus is the Father in the flesh. Amen. That's a great, great truth that we value. Matthew 27, verse 62 through 66. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, <clears throat> saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher, the grave, the tomb, be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Uh, ye, I'm going to give you permission to take the soldiers, what he said. Go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Means they put guards up there. Go to chapter 28, verse 1 through verse 8. <clears throat> Matthew 28, verse 1. And the, in the end of the Sabbath, it, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers, the guards, did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear, ye, fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Now is not, he is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come see the place where the Lord did lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples. You know, a woman was the first evangelist sent by God. People don't believe in women ministers. Well, you got some in the Bible. Amen. Go quickly and tell. Now, I believe that women ought to be under the authority of men. I believe that. I believe in headship. But that ain't just women under men. Men ought to be under men. That's why I don't believe in non-denominationalism. Because a lot of that is somebody wanting to be on top with nobody over them. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. But I have to be under ministry too. Everyone has to be under authority in the body of Christ. What about Brother Bernard? He's on top, isn't he? He has to be under a board of directors. Everyone needs to be under authority in the body of Christ. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear, in great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. Going over now to Romans chapter 8. I'm sorry, John chapter 2, excuse me. John 2 and verse 18. John chapter 2 and verse 18 through 22. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus just wrecked the temple. He just turned over tables. Tore the place up. You remember that saying, what would Jesus do? Well, he might wreck the place. It was righteous indignation. 
means he was right in doing it in the sight of God. I believe somebody breaks into your house and is trying to kill you and your kids and you shoot them dead, you've done the right thing. Because that is your job before God to take care of your household. That's called righteous indignation. Say, well, I thought killing was a sin. Not all killing is sin. Murder is a sin. When the Bible says thou shalt not kill, the Hebrew word there means murder. Murder is the killing of innocent people. Not the killing of the guilty. There's a different word in Hebrew for that. Just so you know. Amen. And so there's a right time to be angry with stuff. And it's not when you get cut off in traffic. Just so you know that too. That's my righteous indignation. I lay on this horn and show them straight from God to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Most of our indignation is not righteous, but there is a righteous indignation. Hating false doctrine is righteous indignation. Loving those in false doctrine is right, but hating false doctrine is also right. There's a way that seemeth right, but the end thereof is the ways of death. Paul, David said, I hate every false way. I love everybody in false ways, but I hate every false way. Amen? That's a righteous indignation. To desire and want the right thing. And it wasn't right for him to be selling uh, livestock in the temple. My brother Anderson taught years ago, I'll get back to this, he taught, why, do, why were they selling that livestock in the temple when Jesus came through and with a whip and ran them all out, all the money changers and stuff? They were selling that stuff so it was easy to give a sacrifice. Back when they first made up the rule of sacrificing, you'd have to sacrifice something you raised at your house that your kids got attached to. At my house, we got rabbits. They're going to live until they die. We just feed them. We don't even go look at them anymore. They don't know I exist. But we can't kill them because the kids know them. They always say, if you're going to kill it, don't name it. So we're going to just feed it till it dies of natural causes because you get attached to stuff. Back when Moses made the law of sacrifice, he said, bring a goat or a turtle over this or that. Well, you had to raise that and it became something you knew. You had to give something to God that meant something to you. It was called a sacrifice. But when Jesus came along, you had money changers in the temple. They raised the livestock and they made it a, a place of making money. And you can go buy a lamb that you've never seen in your life, hadn't fed one time, have no connection to. I'll give you $5 for that lamb. Here you go, priest, here's my lamb. It cost you, well, it cost you money, but it cost you no value to your heart. Somebody say praise the Lord. And Jesus came through a whip and said this ain't what it's about. I just don't want a money deal. I want your heart. I want it to mean something to you when you give me something. Matter of fact, if you give God a tip, you haven't impressed God at all. Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy. And after he whipped them all up, they said, what, do you, what authority do you have to come in here with a whip and do this? He said this, destroy this temple, and, I, and, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple you're standing in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. One more verse, verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said unto them, uh, uh, this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Go now to Romans 8, verse 9. Quite a few verses this morning. Romans 8, verse 9 through 11. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit, notice, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are not two different spirits. It's one and the same. Any man have not the Spirit, that's why when we get the Holy Ghost, we're not getting the third person in the Trinity. When you get the Holy Ghost, you're getting the Spirit of Christ, Amen. which is the Spirit of God. And there's only one Spirit. Right. 
Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's why you got to receive the Holy Ghost. That's the power to overcome. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. That means your body is going to die. It's cursed. No matter how much of God you got in you, your body is not going to make it. It's cursed. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. That means that you're going to be resurrected to a new body because His Spirit is in you. Verse 11, finally, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52. 1 Corinthians 15 and 52. Here's how it's going to happen. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, your bodies are going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling. There's a popular false doctrine in the world that everyone's going to just vanish. That's not what's going to happen. We're not going to just disappear. Your clothes are not going to be folded up on the ground where you were standing. Makes for a good movie, but it's not true. Our bodies are going to be changed like that. Quicker than that, our bodies will be transformed to a glorified body, and then we will rise to meet the Lord in the air. And everybody's going to see us. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Finally, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. We'll be reading verse 13 through 18. Paul said this, but I would not have you to be ignorant. Brethren, aren't you glad there's commas? Yes. If there wasn't a comma there, he would just say, I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren. <laughs> he'd call you a name. They don't know, call me no name. Well, Jesus called a woman a dog. And when she didn't get offended, she got a miracle. Be careful if the word of God offends you. You might miss out on your miracle. If you leave church offended, you may have just missed your greatest miracle. The Word of God will test you to see if you'll humble down and say, if the Lord calls you a dog, say, roof, roof. That's hallelujah in dog language. Yeah, I'm not a dog. Yes, I am. He said I was. I'm the best dog he's got. I'll get spiritual here in a little bit. I'll get there. Just, just hang with me. People, that we live in the most easily offended world I've ever seen in my life. People are just ready to be offended. They're just hoping people leave church because they're offended. Listen, if you hang around here long enough, I'm probably going to do something that's offensive to you. And you're probably going to do something that's offensive to me. But we have to love each other so much that we forgive one another. Endeavor to keep the bonds of peace and love. But I would, I would not have you to be ignorant, comma, brethren. That means I want you to understand some stuff. Concerning them which are asleep or them which are dead, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Funerals are sad occasion unless you're in Christ. In Christ, it's a victory beyond measure. Amen. In Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, is a powerful writing about the importance of meaning and value in the human life. 
And everyone needs to understand you are valuable. And God loves you. Frankel was a Jewish psychologist who survived both, both Dosh and Auschwitz concentration camps during World War II. Went through both of them. The prisoners considered themselves fortunate in those camps if they had one pea, one pea for dinner. Not a bowl of peas, but one pea. They would barter in the, in the sleeping quarters for a small piece of dry bread. Frankel described those living under those conditions as dead, but still walking around. The picture Frankel drew with his words uh, of people walking around in concentration camps, emas emaciated, literally starving to death, yet still alive, is a profound picture of humanity without the Lord Jesus Christ. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, the Bible said. We're just walking around, but we're dead. Until the Lord comes and breathes on us the breath of life, we're just dead men. We are captured by sin until the Lord comes and sets us free. We still have to fight with sin, but we're not sin's captive anymore. For he that the Son is set free is free indeed. All you got to do is believe the treaty. You know, when the Emancipation Proclamation came out years ago to set free the slaves, there were some slaves that remained slaves after that was written because they chose to. There were other slaves that remained slaves because they didn't know there was a treaty that said they didn't have to be a slave. But yet there were other slaves that knew there was a treaty but didn't believe the treaty. For heaven's sake, I'm here to tell you, heaven's made a treaty with us. We can be free and free indeed. We don't have to be the slaves of sin any longer. We don't have to live bitter or offended or hateful. No, we can have liberty and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. That's God's treaty with us. But we, before we came into contract with God. But you got to come in contract. You know, to, to, want the, to want the promises and the privileges of God, to want God to do what He said He would do, but you won't do what He said you ought to do? My goodness, you're trying to have marital privileges without marital vows. God wants to marry us. Hello? The adversary's plan for all humanity was to keep us in a dead position. Truly, all people are dead in these trespasses and sin when we are born, but God stands ready to make us alive again through Christ Jesus' death and burial and resurrection at Calvary. And when we obey his gospel, we take on Calvary. For at Calvary he died, he was buried, and he rose again. And when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, we die to our sins through repentance. We are buried in water in Jesus' name. And then God promises to fill us with the Holy Ghost, talking in tongues. That we can walk in newness of life. In other words, his victory becomes our victory. This is the promise of resurrection. How sad it would be today if the resurrection we celebrate was only his resurrection. But it's not. We celebrate our resurrection. That because he lives, we live. Because he overcame, we will overcome. Jesus said, don't be afraid, I've overcome the world. Well, that don't give me any comfort if you did it. What he was inferring was, if I did it, you can do it. Jesus promised he would rise again. Jesus told the disciples he would be handed over to the Gentiles for them to mock him and to scourge him and to crucify him. I was telling the kids this morning in the car on the way to church about why crucifixion, because crucifixion was the most heinous, hurtful death you could have. Because in crucifixion, the idea was for you to die a slow 
painful death, fighting for every single breath. How horrible it is to know that if I push myself back up on these nails that are in my wrists and in my hands, I can get one more breath that I can live a few more seconds to agonize on this cross. Yet your body convulsing for air will pull through the pain of the nails to push up for one more breath. You literally fight to suffer. That's why crucifixion was so horrible. You could just give up and die quick, but you want air so bad, you'll fight for it. But he overcame that for us. Amen? Amen? And then he rose from the dead. He said the third day, he would rise again from the dead. Now, it gives me great comfort to know the disciples heard this several times, but it still didn't register. But you know why it didn't register? Because, you know, sometimes we only see what we're looking for. They were looking for seats in the new kingdom. Who's going to get the best seat? They were looking for the overthrow of Rome rulership. Jesus didn't come to do that. He came to create a church, a new kingdom on the earth. And they could not see his death because all they could see was themselves ruling. You ever drove by somewhere and never saw it? I've had people say, you know that store over on X, and I've drove by there a thousand times. I said, what? There's a store there named what? I've never saw it. You know why I didn't see it? I wasn't looking for it. You know, I thought some folks can't find God. They're not looking for him. Oh, but if you start looking for him, you'll find him. He said the third day he would rise again. And when he died, they all went into hiding. They didn't believe what he said. Matter of fact, what was it? Peter said, Lord, be it far from you this happens. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, I rebuke you, Satan. You don't mind the things of God. In other words, suffering can be a part of God's plan. Hello? The resurrection promise came through that Jesus spoke of. In different ways, depending on which gospel one is reading. If you read Matthew, you'll find... It talks about the cost of discipleship and laying down one's life. What will it cost me to go to heaven? I will tell you this morning, it's going to cost you everything. He, he don't want to be second, third, or fourth on your list. He wants to be number one. Matter of fact, if you can make it to work five days a week, six days a week, but you can't make it to church, he wants to be number one. So ooh, that offended me. Yeah, that's what the word does. It cuts both ways. But unlike the murderer who wants to kill you with the sword, the surgeon from heaven, Almighty God, wants to save you with the sword. If you'll lay still and let him cut you, he'll cut the stuff out that'll keep you out of heaven. Well, I'm going to preach this morning. But Matthew talks about the cost of discipleship, the laying down of one's life. The emphasis in Matthew is on the suffering of Jesus Christ. Matthew was helping those Jewish readers understand that Jesus was the suffering servant who bore the sins of the world. And Jesus prophesied about both his suffering and his resurrection. And he told us, if you'll suffer with me, you'll reign with me. Our suffering today may not be losing our life. One day it may be. When the mark of the beast gets here, it will be. Some will lose their lives if they don't take that mark. But our suffering might just be to put our flesh down and put Jesus on top. Say, well, where can I do that, Pastor? Glad you asked. All of us get a calendar, a clock, and a checkbook. And there's places we can put God first in our lives. So oh, I'm getting offensive now. Did I just mention money? Oh, be it far from me. You know, Jesus talks about money more than he does prayer. You know why? 
Because praying on Facebook don't mean a whole lot if your heart's a long ways from God. Well, oh Lord, it's Easter. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to build it in three days? But he wasn't speaking about that physical temple. He's speaking about his body. Had they known he was speaking of his body, they would have been even more stunned that he would say such a thing. Since he was fully God, he was involved in raising his own lifeless body. But since he was fully man, he was willingly submitted to death, even the death on the cross. Our Jesus is fully God and fully man. And he could play both roles. Jesus could walk through a wall and eat a fish. He could cry over dead Lazarus and then say, Lazarus, get up. He could function as both as he saw fit. Jesus said in John 10, 17 through 18, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. As Isaiah prophesied some 800 years before it happened, Jesus was like a lamb led to the slaughter. Why is he like a lamb? Because you lead a lamb to the slaughter, he don't fight and buck and kick. Try to tie a rope around a pig's neck and lead him to a slaughter. You can ask Will about it. You're going to need several big men to fight one big pig. They don't go easy to a slaughter, but they taste good enough to fight them. It's worth the fight when you get the bacon. Hallelujah. But a lamb to the slaughter, it don't fight. It doesn't. It just goes right on. Jesus never fought or bucked or kicked, and he knew where he was headed. He said, no one takes my life. He said, I could call a legion of angels right now and stop this whole thing. But for this purpose have I come into the earth. What purpose, Lord? Because one day there's going to be a David Abington. One day there's going to be a Brady Gardner. One day there's going to be a Doug Brooks. For this purpose I came into the earth that I might bear their sins on a cross. Thank God for Jesus. I don't want to pay for my sins. The price is too high. Thank God I have a Savior who is Christ the Lord who I can turn to him and cast my sins on him and he will forgive me. He's ready and willing and able to redeem me from all unrighteousness and sin. Thank God for what he's done for us. He's fully God and he's fully man. Jesus said in John 10, he said, I lay down my life. Nobody takes it. You can't take his life. In the garden, Adam willingly disobeyed and chose his own way with no consideration of others. Adam sought his own advantage, but not so with Jesus. Jesus sought our advantage. He did what was best for us, not himself. Jesus had every right to refuse because he was sinless and he was guilty of no sin. He was falsely accused. I, I guess in my mind, maybe there's nothing more horrible as someone going to the death chair under a false accusation. It happens. It's terrible. That's why I believe our founder said, I can't remember who it was, he said it's better that a thousand guilty go free than one innocent be sentenced. That's why you're to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. Say, but I know they did it. Still, you have to presume them innocent. Because it's better for a thousand guilty to go free than one innocent be put to death. Yet Jesus was innocent. And they put him to death. He had false accusers. I wonder how many of those false accusers, if not themselves, had relatives that he had touched and healed and helped and provided for. Yet he opened not his 
mouth. Why? He wasn't about to fight against this one. I don't deserve it. But because he took it, I get what I don't deserve. I get mercy. I get grace. I get peace because of what he did. And he had every right to refuse, to withdraw, to hold back. He even had the power to stop it. But he wouldn't. He knew the sacrifice involved and the pain that was coming his way. That's why the first blood shed at Calvary was in a prayer meeting. He prayed until great drops of blood came from his brow because he knew in his flesh what he was facing, agony and despair for you and for me. Yet he laid down his life willingly. The Bible says in a strange verse, Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy? Oh, this is going to get good. The joy set before him was you. He wanted you too much to bypass Calvary. That's a good God. Oh, how he loves you and me. Don't you tell me there's anybody beyond his reach. He loves us too much. The story of Jesus laying down his life continued as he died on the cross and then was buried. We're told of a secret disciple named Joseph of Arimathea from the town of Arimathea who came to take the body of Jesus to bury it. And this story is found in each of the Gospels. Because it's important. John tells us that Joseph was a secret disciple. The exact information about Jesus' burial highlights the authenticity and the truth of the gospel message. Jesus' burial. Go to, uh, let's see, go to Isaiah 53 and verse 9. Isaiah 53, verse 9. Jesus' burial in Joseph's tombs fulfilled prophecy. Here it is. And he made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Well, what's the prophecy there, Pastor? Well, usually the rich, rich don't, the wicked don't get to be buried with the rich. But Jesus died between two thieves, but was buried in a tomb that had never been used and was owned by a rich man. He fulfilled. He was buried like a criminal, but yet put in a rich man's grave. This is the principal proof of Christianity. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. An honest evaluation from history proves Jesus rose from the dead. One of the great atheists, used to be an atheist of our time, Lee Strobel, wrote a book about the proof of Jesus. He set out to disprove the resurrection. He set out to disprove Jesus Christ was who he said. And in his studies and in his evaluations, he finally converted and said it had to happen. There's too much proof that it was true. Jesus' resurrection means he is Lord of history and he is King of kings. His resurrection proves he was who he claimed to be. Jesus' resurrection proves he is to be worshipped and adored. Before him, every knee must bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Now, everyone's not going to do it today, but everyone's going to do it. The resurrection of Jesus is not intended to be an empty exercise in research or even in religion. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I don't know what's coming tomorrow, but I know who lives. And the one who lives said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. The future hope we have because of Jesus' resurrection is solid and sure. We can face any uncertainty because we know Jesus is with us. Social unrest, global pandemics, political turmoil, all must bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is above all things. And we can trust him with our future. But not just can we trust him with our future. 
not just because he lives, I can face tomorrow, but because he lives, I can face today. I can make it through whatever. He's going to help me. No sickness, no cancer, no depression, no addiction, no broken relationship can stop what Jesus has done for me at Calvary and at the resurrection. We have hope because our Savior lives today. And he's not a God far off. But the Bible says he's a very present help in the time of trouble. He's always with me. And through that gospel message that Peter preached in Acts 2, I can be buried in Christ, filled with Christ. Isn't that wonderful in the message of Calvary? Death, burial, and resurrection. We die at the altar in repentance, and then we're buried in Jesus' name. And the Bible says when you're buried in his name, you put on Christ. Like an external garment, you put him on on the outside. And then when he fills you with the Holy Ghost, you're filled with Jesus Christ. So outside and inside, you got Jesus. And he lives. Paul wrote in Romans 3 and 23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The spiritual death people live in is real and felt. There is no earthly filler, though many try. They try to find somebody to fill that void. They try to find some substance to fill that void. But nothing can fill that void. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only he can do it. There's a God-shaped hole in every heart that can only be filled by Jesus. Many times when people walk into an apostolic service, they'll find themselves tearful and weeping first time they've ever experienced this love of God and their human spirits realize and connect to the spirit of God it only happens because the resurrection is real it's not what the preacher says but what God is saying that matters but God goes beyond that not only can you feel God when he touches you but you're supposed to be filled with God when he fills you with his spirit. And that is the power to overcome. The resurrection life of Jesus is given to us by his Holy Spirit. Notice it's called the Holy Spirit. Because if we walk in the Holy Spirit, we're going to become holy. Initially, he makes us holy just by his spirit coming in us. But then he begins the renovation project in our life to make us more like him and less like the world as we become more and more like Christ. We have the power of the Holy Ghost to overcome whatever comes our way because we're born fleshly and carnal and wicked, and we still have to battle that. But the Holy Ghost begins to transform us into the image of Christ from glory to glory. Even by his spirit, we become more spiritually minded in our walk with God. You know what happens? The more you become spiritual minded, the less the world recognizes you or understands you. You know why? You're from another world. You ever heard the word weird? And people are weird. You know, the Bible calls us weird. It's a different word. Peculiar. Peculiar means weird. Them folks are a little weird over there. They told Paul, they said, you're beside yourself. What that means is you're psycho. He said, yeah, you're right. When it comes to God, I'm beside myself. I don't disagree. I'm weird when it comes to the things of God. The same spirit that raised up the lifeless body of Jesus Christ will raise us up at the resurrection of the dead in the end times when that last trump shall sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Where are those saints right now? Well, the Bible tells us. Me and Sister Hirsch were talking about it this morning. Many of them are under the altar saying, Lord, how long? 
To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you die, if you're in Christ, you will know you're in Christ. And then you're a disembodied spirit until that resurrection day. And at that resurrection morning, when that last trumpet shall sound, you're going to be given a glorified body. For the Bible says, when we see him, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. There was confusion and sadness in that church in Ephesus when Paul came along. And Paul wrote, as we read this morning, to instruct them that even though some of the disciples had died, they had in no way a reason to weep or mourn over them. They had not missed what God was planning to do when he came back. Oh, no. He said, don't weep for them, for the dead in Christ are going to rise first when he comes back. What a resurrection that's going to be. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with a with the Lord. It's going to be a glorious day. And it's coming. And if the Lord allows us to tarry until he comes, we're going to know. As we've taught in Bible prophecy, we're going to know that day and that hour as it comes upon us one day. Because God has not left us to wander aimlessly. He told us to watch because there's going to be something to watch for. He going to told us to pray because we're going to need to stay ready for his coming. And on that day, we're going to be clothed with immortality and incorruptibility, never to fight with sin again. Because he rose from the dead and lives forevermore, we can thrive today and have hope for tomorrow. That's why the Bible says, and I close with this, we can stand. little verse in the Bible that says this. In everything, give thanks. Not for everything. In everything, give thanks. Well, Pastor, I'm terminal. I'm dying. Pastor, something horrible happened. Yeah, but you got something to be thankful for. What is it? You got a resurrected Savior. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Why don't you lift your hands right now and give God thanks for what he has done for us. Lord, the unspeakable gift that you have given us. The hope that we have through your death, your burial, and your resurrection is beyond our comprehension and understanding. But yet, God, we stand in gratitude and thankfulness today that you are a risen Lord, that we are not left hopeless or helpless, that our sins do not have to conquer us, but because of you, we can overcome, Lord, and live a life of victory and peace and hope. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us.